Hello everyone and welcome to our session today on seven e-commerce best practices to meet your B2B buyer's demands. Joining us today is Giuseppe Ayani from Sana Commerce and we are excited to have such a fantastic turnout today. Before I pass it over to Giuseppe to cover on this hot topic, I would like to remind you that this session is being recorded and it will be posted to our on-demand webinar library for you to review and share with anyone. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them into the questions box and we will get them answered during our Q&A time at the end of our session. And so now I will pass it on to Giuseppe to kick off our presentation. Hello and welcome everybody. We appreciate uh, everybody who's taken the time uh, to come here to learn a little bit today. Um, and as we kick things off in the webinar today, we're gonna to start with some tangible tips on how to meet B2B buyer demands in 2019 and how to overcome some of the more common B2B e-commerce hurdles we, we see in the marketplace. Um, we'll also be sharing some fresh data from our latest research report and offering you insights into key findings that have come out of this data. You may be thinking, well, this might not be as relevant for me based on what I've heard so far. Um, I already understand my buyers or I know how e-commerce should work, but demands are quickly changing, evolving in the marketplace, especially in the B2B market um, today. New technologies are coming into play and ways of working, new ways of working are emerging. In short, you know, the buyers today you thought you understood a year or two ago may be nothing like the buyers you're facing today or tomorrow. Um, so I wanna start by giving you a quick overview of what to expect from the webinar today, and then we're gonna kick off with some trivia questions. Um, and each of these will go through and give you a little bit better insight as to what to expect from some of the online buyers today. Um, so hopefully um, you would get a lot out of this today. So um, to kick off, my name is Giuseppe Anni and the VP of Sales here at Sana Commerce. I've been in this space closing in on 15 years now, helping organizations transform the way that they operate their businesses. Um, and I'm here really to speak briefly um, to you guys about the, the core agenda. And we're gonna start again with some of those questions here, um, really trivia questions to I think figure out, do you really understand what's happening in the marketplace today? Um, and hopefully I think get out on the table a few more common misconceptions. Uh, about what you think about your audience. Then we'll dig into the reality of what the buyer's purchasing experience looks like today and what the expectations look like today and into the future. And then we'll dive into some of the best practices we've identified um, to help better um, put together a long list of e-commerce demands in the e-commerce market um, for you guys as organizations that are listening in today or partners that are listening in today. So we'll start, um, and as I noted, we're gonna jump into some of the current buyer expectations, right? Goals and challenges online. So feel free to answer on your own as we go along. Um, if you have any questions, we can address them at the end of this presentation. You can also use the comment box to submit um, your answer if you um, think that there's something different you wanted to add into it um, for other people who are watching as well. So let's try to keep this initial part um, heavily interactive. The first question we come on is, on average, what percentage of products do B2B buyers today purchase online? Uh, an interesting question, so again, I'll, I'll read it again, right? And the poll's now open so you guys can fill in, right? On average, what percentage of products do B2B buyers purchase online? And if you can, just quickly throw in your thoughts here. Um, we're gonna close it down here in a, in a few seconds. Um, but it's something I really want everybody to think about. What percentage of products do B2B buyers purchase online. Maybe it, maybe I'll note it's a bit of a tricky one. All right. I think we have a good chunk so far already coming in. So I'm gonna shut this down, okay? And uh, let's get through to the answer, which was B, 75%, right? Um, so I noted this one was a little bit tricky as we're not asking what percentage of B2B buyers simply conduct purchases online, right? That number, according to research, is about 99%, right? And it includes any businesses that make purchases online at all, no matter how much or how little or, or what the frequency might be. This question really dove a little bit deeper um, to give you a better understanding of just how impactful online buying is in B2B commerce. Not only is it true that 99% of buyers make B2B purchases online, but also 
on average, they're making the majority of their purchases online. Um, so from, some food for thought through everybody as we move on to the next one. <clears throat> so the second, what are B2B buyers' two most important KPIs? And we're gonna open up the poll again. The two most important, most critical KPIs to a business to business buyer. All right, we got cost savings efficiency, internal client satisfaction and cost savings and revenue and efficiency. So a couple, I think arguably real critical things that organizations look for, look at, but we're looking for the two most important KPIs according to a survey here. I'm curious to everybody's thoughts here today. So if you can just fill in, I'm gonna give everybody just a little bit more time as I know we have a pretty large audience online here today and appreciate all your guys' feedback. This is something if you're interested, we can always share some feedback with you guys as well on this. <clears throat> and I think we have almost everybody in here now. I would say don't underestimate it, but don't also overthink it. Okay. I think we're there. We can, uh, we're gonna close it down in just a second here. And again, what are buyers two most important KPIs? The answer here was cost savings and efficiency, right? So of course, every business cares about revenue um, and they, you know, they drive, you know, satisfaction. They also are critical in ensuring that there's satisfaction at the customer level. These are actually among the top five KPIs as we look at them. The two most important, however, and this is something that rings true across multiple industries and business types, right? Are cost savings and efficiency. This tells us as organizations just want to drive more, don't just want to drive more business. They're also worried about how much more time and budget they're spending to do so, right? Keeping their fir eye firmly on the overall ROI um, that they have with commerce in place. So jumping onto the third one, what percentage of B2B buyers experience online order errors with their top suppliers every two weeks or more? So we can open up the polls again. Um, this one, again, think a little bit about it. I mean, we're talking our, if you, for those of us that are actually selling online with, with wholesalers right now, how many errors do you guys think you have every two weeks on average? And what do you think the industry average would be behind this? Every two weeks, right? Two weeks is a long period of time, but we're talking our top suppliers, right? I think this could be a multitude of, of errors or, or challenges that they might be having here, but still it's our top suppliers we're talking about. What do you think organizations out in the industry are experiencing here? And again, we got a pretty wide variety. We got a low percentage, we got a high percentage out there. We got kind of the middle level, but I wonder how many people are, are really dealing with a multitude of issues in a period of two weeks, especially at the top level where you think think you would be offering a, a more white glove type experience and working with your organization. So as we wrap it up here um, and close out the polls, the answer actually in fact is 44%. Um, it's pretty commonly understood now that online order errors are a challenge for most organization, right? And a large part of that is human error combined with the complexity of some B2B purchases um, and the difficulty many organizations are having, right? Getting the right data into their web stores, to ensure that you know the client can even place an accurate order, right? Um, but maybe a question to ask yourself is, did you anticipate the frequency or the severity of this issue to be larger or smaller, right? Do you think it's a large hurdle for your organization or do you think it's a small one to overcome? As we look to the data, you know, even with their top 10 suppliers, nearly half of all B2B organizations we surveyed claim to experience online order errors every two weeks or more. Now think of how much more time and money is wasted in that particular business operation. I had a pretty large RFE come across my desk and this was one of the most common reasons that the organization wanted to put in place um, a more tightly integrated portal was to resolve this one particular issue because it was costing them so many man hours, so many uh, phone calls back to the customer service departments in particular. And think of how frequent this may be with your other suppliers, right? Beyond the top 10. Think about the total number uh, of order entry errors that goes beyond a two-week scope um, on a calendar year that your business sees. 
And I think this can get expensive for you as an organization and not only that, but exhausting, not only for you as a business, right, but also your customers very quickly. Hey, why am I working with these guys when I'm constantly having issues um, that I'm not seeing with um, other organizations or, right, or Amazon, you know, in my day-to-day -day buying purchase, right? How do we strive to do better? So with that, let's move on to our final question and jump into the rest of the presentation, which I'm sure you guys are eager to hear more about. Um, this one, last one focuses on um, buyer demands, right? Um, what is the main factor that will impact B2B buyers' roles in the next five years? This is an interesting run, right? Um, the need for more product or vendor searches, the need for more, more compliance checks or a shift towards automating purchases, right? What do we feel like is gonna impact the B2B buyer role? Um, in interacting with us as an organization over the next five years. And keep in mind, this is something that we know that these demands, you know, are always going to be ever changing, constantly changing. So I think this, this gives us a little bit of insight as to what's coming down the road. I know we've, oh, we're, we're moving pretty well today. You guys got uh, a good chunk of our responses already in, so appreciate that. Got a few left. So again, uh, this was a bit of a tough one as we, we look to close this particular poll up. Um, I think as we look at the list, I think we have everything buttoned up from a polling standpoint. Okay, yep, we're good. Um, as we look at this, right, I said it was kind of a tough one, but we, as we look at all the factors, right, the answer here was C, right, a shift towards more automating purchases. Um, because with all these factors are among, you know, uh, a B2B organizations, um, key risk, key issues or key challenges as, as we look to the futures that will come into play, but the most important and most impactful over the next five years will be automation, specifically the automation of the purchasing process, um, into the future. So how as an organization, are we automating this process for co our customers that we're interacting with to bring in a higher level of automation? You know, a lot of people that I, I've dealt with or, or spoken with over the past 15 years, it's how can we quickly, quickly get transactions in? How can we make it easy for them to find the right products and get the products into the cart? But now it's moving towards a more AI driven, right? How do we automate the recurring ordering um, for these particular customers, knowing what they've done or how they've interacted with, with us in the past? So more again, automation. So. How'd you do? You know, I think it's something you can ask yourself. And I think as we, we know what we thought we know about this or what we do know about this, let's clear up some of the more common misconceptions that are out there. Um, and as we conclude our survey portion, I want to jump into, um, you know, the next section here around B2B commerce um, and hopefully um, set precedence for some additional insights as to what's happening in the future. And, and for this, you know, we're going to go back into our APO research report um, that we had run. And this was just run in 2019. Um, we surveyed about 560 professional buyers across the industry, whether it was manufacturers, wholesalers, distributors. Um, and the research are, are what the research and the results from that are what we're going to go through today. And it and it isn't just about meeting customers buying demands online, right? And this demand, as we look at commerce, right, it's also about finding a more specific, sophisticated e-commerce experience. And that's really what this report targeted and focused a little bit on as the end result. And for anyone who hasn't already read the report, we're gonna share it again in an email. Otherwise, there's a handout attached um, that you guys can immediately download now. So feel free to do that during the recording today. Otherwise, again, we'll also be sending it out. So here's what we found. You know, From our quiz, we learned a few things today about B2B buyers. They're buying online frequently. They expect more from an e-commerce site. We know that they want to experience less errors. They want to have a better experience and a more reliable, accurate information shown to them and be able to leverage more advanced e-commerce functionalities. And now that we know what is the goal though, how can we get there as an organization, right? And I want to now dive into some of the more newer data that we have and talk through the best way to embrace and address some of the more common B2B buyer challenges and needs that are in the marketplace today. Um, so all things that I want to talk about is as we jump through into this next segment here. So how can we achieve it? Well, as we've already touched upon uh, the webinar today, we're going to talk about the seven best practices for how to meet buyer demands. And, and to do so, we'll, we're going to take an if-then type approach. 
So before each best practice we recommend, we'll share some of the data from our research that drives home the why this is important approach and then or how it will help address the B2B commerce challenge in particular. So as we kick off, you know, how can you fulfill your buyer's needs through an e-commerce platform? There is, of course, a lot you can do as an organization, but to get you started in this webinar, we'll talk through seven of the most effective practices. Um, so here's a quick overview of what we're going to dive into. <clears throat> and as you can see, we'll be talking about SEO, website functionality, marketing automation, and ways to inform and educate your clients on top of some other, right? So really the core things that we're going to dig into today. So as we kick off, um, we've taken, I think, a 10,000 foot view of what our best practices are really all about. Um, and now we're going to dive into the detail. We'll match each best practice with the right data to drive each point home and with each step on how to execute both at a high level and from a more granular point of view. So number one, and here is our, our first recommended best practice. As we go along, we'll see that each will have an accompanying stat or proof point here as clearly defined. So first, let's understand the opportunity in how B2B buyers do research. During the buying process, almost half of buyers conduct web searches to look for info, solutions, and suppliers. We then jump over to the best practice needed here to take advantage of this behavior. It's all about SEO, ensuring your website is optimized for search engines. And the next slide, we'll, we'll really talk a little bit more on how to do just that. So as we get into it, there's a multitude of ways to do this. But as we look at um, the website being optimized for search engines, looking at keywords, looking at technical setup of your web store and whether your web store is mobile friendly, will all have a huge impact on SEO. From a more practical PO view, point of view, the SEO tips um, you see here all fit into really four main categories or pillars or building blocks. Um, so from that standpoint, content, technical setup, user experience, and link building, right? All are big, heavy pieces that I think help drive more detail, more granular detail and tips into the picture. So if you're not an SEO, SEO export, these may not mean much to you, but trust that they, at the end of the day, impact your reach that your business will have and how you'll engage with the audience that you want. It can make or break whether or not your relevant prospect even comes to you across your website at all. Um, so just things to take a look at. And again, you can dig into this deeper at a later time or share with the appropriate users inside of your organization as well when the time is right. Here we got a quick example um, from one of our customer websites, actually Telerex, who optimized their, their content for FCO. Both paged and organic search results show content that is highly valuable and highly relevant for the search term. And because the SEO best practices were followed, Google recognized this as well, allowing them to rank in a way that potential buyers could find them before they found a competitor or other options on different sites. Their page is also full of useful product info, making sure that a prospect has landed on this page, they can be offered the insights that they need to make an informed purchasing decision without a bunch of hurdles. So moving on, we jump on onto the second tip, right? And what do buyers want, right? Well, during the buying process, 37% of buyers will search their supplier's website to look for information and solutions. So for you guys, this means that you not only have to have the right info on your site, but it also needs to be easy to find or they're gonna abandon the site quickly. Often they're only willing to spend a few seconds to give them, um, to give you a shot. Otherwise they're gonna find another option. And on mobile, this grace period typically lasts no longer than three seconds. So from a best practice standpoint, you need to look to improve your on-site search function. And so if you ever tried this, you know, you need to find something on a website without a search bar, right? Then you know how frustrating it is to actually dig into and find what you need. Um, I, I know you see it very infrequently, but there are sites out there that still don't have this. So I think all of us know how important the search bar is and can make it that much quicker and easier to browse and find and purchase products. And on average here, 80% of B2B visitors to a web store use the search function. As they generally know exactly what they need once they've gotten there, this means that they need to be featured prominently on the site, the search box, and that it will benefit you to be aware of what they're searching for, which can lead to a more e-commerce conversions without much extra effort. So as seen here in this slide, um, we have five additional steps to leverage Google Analytics to optimize your site search bar fun functionality and to optimize your search content to match keywords your online visitors are actually searching for. 
The reality of commerce today is that online channels put options, information, and suppliers at the tip of a B2B um, buyer's fingertips in a way that was never possible before e-commerce. Six out of 10 people today prefer access to information they need online, as opposed to hunting for it offline. That means it's your job to make it simple and seamless to do so. Not only does this mean that you need to stand out amongst the crowd, as we mentioned with our best practices guide on SEO, and that your site needs to be easily navigated, but once a visitor does come to your website and find what they need, they'll also need the right amount of info to do their own research and make an informed purchasing decision. And for your business, this means a strong and clear product description, but it doesn't stop just there, right? We need to take it further. And that's where we jump into empowering your buyers. Your website content matters. And we know this, of course, but that doesn't mean just having a clear search bar or lengthy product description on your website, as we've talked about. This also means going beyond that to leverage your internal experts knowledge right, on your products and give your, web your visitors a way to educate and inform themselves prior to making that decision purchase. You never want to obstruct a visitor's path to researching and finding the info they want when it will lead them to a purchasing decision. You want to maximize the education and information offered to your visitors, and you can focus on getting them the right content through many avenues, like a video, a blog, an FAQ, or something different. So as you look at this checklist above or make a mental note of how many of these avenues your business is currently leveraging and monitoring and investing time and in optimizing, right? All things to consider. <coughs> so here's an example again of another Sonic client, Royal Brinkman. They use their knowledge center and advice section, which was prominently displayed here in the nav toolbar to mitigate visitors challenges and questions and give them the opportunity to have all the answers they need 24 seven. So you can see this on the left hand side. Whereas on the right, you see, once again, we're taking a look at some nice work from a customer, Telerex, right? In this case, you see that on their product pages, um, they included an extended product set of information, related products as well. And they saw that after, ap that after optimizing this content in this particular way, they saw profits jump by about 24x. Um, and yes, this isn't a typo, right? Um, so it really was able to better inform their clients on what they were purchasing and what it was that made this product or solution different and it helped them drive additional sales revenue, um, in this case, 24 fold. And by implementing changes like these, the, 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 the final benefit to you as an organization is you're gonna save time answering the same questions over and over or taking these phone calls and emails from buyers when they can actually self-serve and find this information online. Which jumps us to our next best practice, right? wanting an easier and faster checkout as a priority. So as we jump here, right, you know, what do buyers want? We know they want a website that's easy to use, that's speedy, it's quick to return results, but more than 25% of buyers we surveyed here would like to see an easier, faster checkout. An easy re repeat ordering process is what really the bulk of these guys want. So if you recall what we, were, we, were, we already learned from our initial knowledge test, questions, you'll remember that increasing efficiency is a buyer's number two KPI. So checkout simplicity is exactly part of why this is critical. So this is what we can do, right? We can simplify your web store nav. And by doing that, um, it's not necessarily making it complicated, but it does require you keep an eye on the steps and the strategies. So you can see we've already covered one of the checkpoints on the list here, which is an optimized search functionality. The others include a more clear call to action button. So like having an easy to add to basket button on your actual website and using some type of standout color to improve the overall user experience. So ultimately in the end, you want not just to make the web store intuitive and simple to browse, but over time you could test things like color or the number of checkout steps and look at the data to understand where your visitors are dropping off in the purchasing journey and eliminate any points of friction that might be there. And you could see from one of the core sauna templates here, um, we're gonna show you a real life example. Um, with this checkout, you know, they have colorful call to action buttons, clearly defined options, and more customers now are achieving jumps in conversion rate up to about 21% by improving the, and improving customer loyalty by implementing strong checkout processes. Um, so I think another great example of what organizations can do to increase their overall conversion weight with a strategy like this and with a little bit of focus and time. Which jumps us to um, our best practice number five. And I think we'll now we'll take more of a direct focus on product data and content. 
in this case, you know, what do your buyers want? Well, about 44% of them noted that their, you know, their online experience, um, they had order errors. And this has had a significant impact on the organization's profitability, efficiency, or productivity. And it notes that from a productivity standpoint, they noted a six to 10% decrease um, in the average for all three of those scenarios, profitability, efficiency, and productivity, and a decrease in about one to 5% in all sales um, due to these challenges. So the top reason for these order errors was really incorrect product selection. Um, so a lot of times organizations, they come to a website, they don't have the data, they put the wrong product in the cart and they purchase it and they need to return. So the solution here is to make sure your descriptions are accurate, use the right keywords to minimize the error, the errors along that buying process. So to help with that, we can enhance the and extend your online product descriptions to include all info that a buyer might need to know um, in, a, in an easy to understand format through images, diagrams, or product specs. And even the case where you might source or sell a very high number of products, start by enhancing descriptions for most of your more popular or higher margin type products to ensure that you're covering your bases there first. Um, and we can also take a look at preventing uh, the uh, preventing loss in revenue due to customer churn as well when it comes to return processing, right? When a client has to return a transaction with you, usually not a good sign and something that will also deter them from potentially ordering with you um, into the future. So this process can be made even easier when e-commerce is in place, especially when e-commerce is communicating directly with your ERP, which in, in that scenario, it can access real-time data like availability. Um, and we'll dive into that a little bit later, but as we look at this um, particular challenge, right, on average, according to our data, we see that these kinds of improvements can decrease your order error rate by up to 16% which I think is critical, right? It's all about making this run more smoothly for not only our clients, but also us as businesses, which is gonna help that overall ROI. So as we jump through to number six, and we're almost here at the finish line, guys, what do buyers want? Well, in short, they're thinking way beyond the basics, even though many web stores today are still failing to meet those minimum expectations. Um, between 18 to 20% of buyers would like to see predictive ordering put in place, more personalized portals, AI put in place to help with the buying decision as a priority to their buying experience. So something to ask yourselves on the phone, do we have AI already put in place on the portal? Or are, we at, are we utilizing that? How is automation going to help um, define this high priority that our buyers have so we understand what they want and how they're going to interact with us into the future? And I think the, one of the, the, be, the benefits there is leveraging some type of marketing automation. So um, as we look at that, there's already a lot of personalization done offline, right? Your reps may proactively suggest new and related products to your customers. You can tell them what you think they placed an order for, um, or if you have incorrect data on file, but how can we translate that to your online channels, right? Leveraging marketing automation to do this um, all directly in your web store from predictive ordering to personalized content can be done by linking to your ERP or a PIM or a CMS system right to your website. And you could do this with Sana now and today and also uh, our future release that's coming out here at the end of the year, we're even further improving our, our capacity to link systems together. So your web store can then make better use of this data to provide a more personalized, optimized experience for each buyer in a programmatic way that minimizes the workload your internal teams need to take on to do so. Right? And this can mean an upsell cross-sell type campaign. It can be a more campaign, more focused on predicted data um, and really give them in some insight as to you understanding what they should be looking to purchase. And the benefit of doing all this in the end is selling more, right? Selling smarter and better servicing your clients. Plus, research we conducted noted that customer success stories suggest that these kind of improvements can boost your number of returning or repeat clients by over 11%, which is also great. So as we've gone through a few and we wrap up here today, the stats we've been showing you throughout this webinar highlight the most common buyer challenges and needs. But should you also uncover buyer's needs that are unique to your region, industry, or company? You can do this by just asking your clients for feedback. And I think here's a few of the ways you can do that. And if you haven't already done so, how to get started. So we look to engage your customers on a more personal level. They do notice the difference between organizations who do and don't, right? That's something that your clients are aware of, and it's not something they're going to feel pain 
buy by you reaching out and asking. In fact, it's a big difference between B2B and B2C organizations is that in B2B, you often have a more tight relationship with your clients. You know them, you talk to them, gathering feedback through automated requests and, and or surveys, even better, a face-to-face -face type panel or user group helps you get ideas on how to improve their buying experience overall. So you can use this checklist to get started if you already have it. Um, and in the end, you know, approaches like this help you better leverage um, the results. You find a lot of improvements or opportunities that you never would have even thought of yourself, right? It, cure, it cures you from the blind spots or internal thinking that you might have as an organization. And we'll show you really where inaccurate assumptions were made along the process. And as an additional benefit, it gives you, it gives the customer involved a feeling of being appreciated and valued. And ideally, they'll become a bigger advocate of your company and online store, thanks to your added attention to their needs. So as we look at what we've learned so far in this webinar, we've offered you seven best practices on how to meet your clients' buying demands. We now come to the end of that list, but we're not done yet. Next, we wanna recap what you've learned, discuss how Sana can help, uh, check all those boxes, and open the floor up to some questions for those who might have some today. So now that we walk through these items, we wanted to give some more thought on how many of these boxes your organization can check off right now. You know, how many would you like to go through? You know, what will it take to get all seven of these boxes checked for your organization? And how can we help to get you guys there, right? Are there challenges that you noted you saw in this thing that you can't overcome, that you know are big or critical to your organization, or are these things that we know we want to jump on top of and solve into the future to better prepare ourselves for today and tomorrow? So with Sana, I think it's important for organizations to understand our integrated approach to commerce can strengthen both your business proposition and your online customer experience at the same time. It can result in successes like you've never seen online, especially when you can tap into and meet your B2B buyer's demands. This can continue if you keep your finger on that pulse and continue to make relevant improvements to your e-commerce experience over time, right? Rome wasn't built in a day. Commerce, you know, wasn't either. It's something that's always evolving. And with an application like Sana, we ensure that your web store uses product, customer, pricing data taken directly from the ERP, which is your single source of truth. We also can look to drive additional functionality like artificial intelligence, product data, and information, and accessing that information real time to better improve um, the quality of the orders um, being placed on the website, but also to eliminate order errors that are placed online as well. So as we look at this um, from more a corporate webinar level, right, a few good questions um, I think have come up here today, and I'm looking through uh, the question and answer panel here. If you guys do have any questions that we want to open up the floor to, um, let us know. We'd be happy to answer them. I got a few I'm going to start through in just a minute here that I can see already were pushed through. So appreciate your guys' comments and feedback. Um, feel free to keep them coming. I know we've wrapped up here in about 40 minutes today, and we got about 20 left. So for those who have them, Feel free to chime them in right now. Um, I'll kick off with the first question, um, which I think is actually uh, a quite good one. Um, we're struggling to get our customers online. Most of them order still via, via phone. Do you have any tips on how to get your clients using a portal? Um, well, actually, I think there's a, a variety of different ways. And again, this is one of those that I think is industry specific. Um, most data would say that clients are really um, willing to work online. They want to work online. Um, and if they're still calling in via phone, I would maybe look at better educate them as to what they can do online, how it improves their experience with you as an organization, right? If they're calling in over the phone, we have to manually key in an order, which again, can result in mistakes. It can take more time. It's not as flexible, right? They can do it 24 seven, 365. Um, oftentimes maybe putting together a small video on the benefit of a portal and what they can actually do there. It's not just about maybe taking the order. It's about um, initiating the return, paying an invoice, the other more admin type things. Initially, if we can get them out to use the website for whatever reason it might be, whatever they'll cling on to, it will typically allow them to get used into accustomed to it and keep coming back. So I think something useful is just maybe a small educational video or write up um, with a quick email send and maybe a promotion to drive them out to the website to get them there initially. Um, that might be helpful. So hopefully that, that tip helps. Um, the next one here is uh, a large percentage of our clients order via EDI. What are the advantages of combining EDI and a web shop? Uh, is there any overlap? <clears throat> 
So I always look, and I know we have actually a great um, white paper here on EDI and commerce, right? Uh, a marriage meant to be, right? And, and I look at them as actually very complementary, right? You have your big box organizations like Walmart, uh, et cetera, that are never gonna come to a web store really um, to interact with your business. Um, but I think the benefit to having both is, you know, that EDI portion of your business is, as we look at the 80-20 rule, will be just that, it's 80% of your business. But oftentimes it's the 20% of the mom and pops or the smaller organizations, they're gonna suck up a lot of your sales team or your customer service team's time. Um, so just something to think about, and that's really where commerce can come in, is it can handle the one-off orders, it can handle uh, the ability to take and process payments, it can handle returns, and it's very supplemental to an organization who still is running EDI and has a need for these other mom and pops, um, or even certain touch points or certain scenarios when e-commerce can very um, quickly supplement the EDI portion of your uh, business and accommodate the other 20%. So hopefully that answers the question there. I got another one <clears throat> trying to scroll over to right now. Uh, the next one here is we're experiencing a high order rate error from orders which are coming in via our web store. This is mainly due to out of stock items or wrongly ordered products. Do you have any best practices on how we can decrease our order rate. Um, so in a case of a high order rate, right, I think it could go back to one of, actually, I think it was three or four that we mentioned uh, in the tip level, right? Um, if you're having errors at a high order level rate, I mean, it could either be due to the fact that, you know, you have out of stock or wrongly ordered products. I mean, out of stock, I think is pretty common, right? A shopping cart and your ERP typically are, are separate databases, separate silos. With an application like Sana in place, we put that on, in one stack. So your, shop, your shopping cart is always showing the same stock levels and availability that your ERP is showing so you don't oversell, right? Um, so in, in a scenario like that, I think it's really beneficial to make sure the two are talking um, and can resolve issues like that that are more common to a lot of organizations who are dealing with the shopping cart. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So maybe one one tip there would be to move it to more of a single stack type approach. Um, otherwise, it's ensuring that, you know, you find a way to quickly synchronize as, as fast as possible the data from one database to the next. Otherwise, you're always gonna run into that more common occurrence in something I think pretty traditional that most organizations still deal with who haven't, what I would say, moved to Commerce 2.0, which is away from the shopping cart dual database um, type approach. And when it comes to wrongly ordered product, well, I think that's where you can also look to optimize or utilize attributing um, or filters, right? When you have attributes and filters that are strong on your website, you not only find products faster, but you ensure fit. Uh, a great, you know, great tooling behind that. You see on a lot of automotive sites, you have fitment behind it, right? Make, model, year, uh, for example, sub model, base. Um, you get down to the right um, fitment, that fitment or, or can be a series of attributes assigned back to a product to ensure that they're what they're finding the right product, entering the right product to the cart that will fit um, what they're looking to purchase. So in this case, it will decrease the overall return rate that we see as an organization. We can also look to further optimize that um, by allowing organizations to process orders, return orders online, which is just one additional step here um, that organizations are beginning to take where we all can obviously feel the, um, the return call from our customer service department, we can also look to automate that by allowing an organization to initiate that process online, capture the relevant data like an image or a reason that the product's being returned and then further automate it on the back office, ensuring that we're not manually again keen in a return, which can also take time and result in errors even on a return. I got uh, one additional one that just came through. Can you talk a little bit about B2B versus B2C? Should a company offer both B2B and B2C via the same website or different websites? If the same, how do you properly track analytics for buyers who will browse the site differently? If different sites, how do you avoid cannibalizing your own SEO? Um, yeah, so this is an interesting one um, as we look at this one in particular. Um, I mean, B2B versus B2C, if you look at the metrics, right? Um, well, the, the two markets are quite different. 
the B2B industry is 2x the size of the retail B2C industry if you look at just market numbers. Um, so it's it's quite quite a bit larger, although only 25% of B2B organizations actually have a portal. Um, though as we look at um, a lot of additional competition in the market, like Amazon in particular, most B2B organizations are opening up retail commerce sites, their own B2C portal, probably one of the most common occurrences in the marketplace today. They're going direct as a consumer or they're opening up their own B2C shop. Um, so should they offer both? Um, I would say yes. I mean, it's a, it's a big trend. I think it depends on what your brand or what your products are. I mean, even some of the more traditional giants of the world, um, even in the biking world, that was all traditionally B2B. You couldn't buy a bike online. You had to go to a supplier or a wholesale and find it and purchase it from there, have now started to sell bikes directly online. Um, and it's become a more common practice, um, whereas traditionally it was locked down for years. Yeah, I mean, you can even buy a car online nowadays. So it's, it's evolved very quickly. Um, so in a scenario like that, I think it's beneficial to have it. Um, the challenge there is, do we want it to be one hybrid site or two sites? Um, I would say the, the more common best practice nowadays is to have one website, um, one domain, one URL, a place for that wholesaler to log in, whereas your general public website's there so you can optimize it and, and have it still perform well from an analytical standpoint. You're then able to track analytics based on login. So if they haven't logged in, you could track that analytic, that buyer's journey. Once they logged in, you have a different set of tracking and reporting and you know who that type of client is. So you can really differentiate how their clients are interacting with you you can also, in a hybrid type site, still have a different experience upon login driven, right? Upon login, price, terms, you know, reports, documentation, data, additional um, buying options, additional self-service options that are enabled that you wouldn't traditionally see on a retail facing site uh, for a customer. So um, I think that helps not necessarily cannibalize your own SEO if you do the hybrid versus doing distinctive websites. Um, but you still see some organizations out there doing distinctive websites for reason X, Y, or Z. It's really just up to you as an organization and outweighing the benefits of each. So good question. Hopefully that, that helps answer. Um, and I'm scrolling through to see if we have any more. Yes, we have one more. Um, we currently only have an online product catalog. However, the manual workload related to keeping the product catalog up to date is quite high. How can we improve? Um, so this is another big one um, we've seen a, a big transition for, right? We talked to a lot of clients and while, you know, Sana, you know, at Sana, we specialize in e-commerce, right? Buying and selling products online. A lot of what we also do is self-service. It's finding a way to better service your clients. And then with that is an online catalog. Um, we have a lot of more traditional uh, B2B suppliers who have chosen to not necessarily start selling to the public or going direct to consumer, but exposing a product catalog. And in a scenario like that, I can take every SKU that you have set up in the ERP. I can say, hey, give me these 10,000. I'm going to push a product catalog out to a public facing website. And from a maintenance standpoint, I have my products created. I have my images ready. Um, I have my av my availability, if I want to expose that available in the ERP along with my attributes, let me just push a product catalog online. You can disable the ability to purchase, add to cart, check out, create an account, all that can be removed, but we can just expose that online product catalog, maybe phase one, maybe phase two, phase three, we want to start selling, right? But phase one, it's just about getting a product catalog online quickly, um, which an integrated solution like Sana can also help um, provide, but also keep the maintenance down by ensuring that we're not having to come in and create a bunch of products from scratch in a shopping cart. Um, which again, lowers the overall maintenance uh, and workload behind getting these products out there. Um, especially when, um, if all we want is a catalog, right, is, is one thing versus if we want a catalog online versus having our wholesalers um, log in and actually self-serve as well. So there's always that hybrid type um, environment that can be deployed, which is nice because you don't have to do it multiple times. So good, uh, good series of questions so far. I don't see any additional that have actually come through the system. Um, so again, if there's are if there is any additional questions, comments you guys have, feel free to reach back out to us. We'd love to hear from you guys. Also, take a look, um, you guys. The handouts available can be downloaded at any point, um, right in the go to um, meeting section here in the middle under handouts. Otherwise, um, questions, comments, feel free to reach back out to Sana. 
hit us up on our website, take a look at any additional content we have there. There's a multitude uh, of information sitting out there ready for you guys, um, and we're here for you. So appreciate your guys' attendance and participation with the great questions today. We look forward to hearing from you and speaking with you guys in the near future. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Giuseppe. It appears that those are all the questions that we had for you today. Please feel free to contact us or the team at Sana Commerce with any additional questions you may have. And I just want to thank Giuseppe again for presenting today and to everyone on today's call or if you're watching on demand, we thank you for joining us. And we do have a few more webinars coming soon this afternoon. We have Richard Pedigo from Calumo presenting on making BI easy and practical. And next Tuesday, October 1st, we have Whit Lester from NAV Payroll presenting on D365 US Payroll Introduction. And check out our website for more of our upcoming events, and that's anovia.com slash events. And we also want to mention that we have our new podcast going on. It's called the Anovia Conversation. You can find out about all the different podcast platforms to listen to on our podcast page, and that's anovia.com slash podcast. So check out our podcast selection and subscribe so you get notified on all of our new episodes. And Inovia is proud to be a platinum sponsor of BCUG Navag Summit in Orlando, Florida this year. This conference is fast approaching. The dates are October 13th through the 18th. If you haven't already registered or you want more information about Summit, check out our conference page on our website, and that's anovia.com slash conferences. All right, thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon on another Anovia webinar. Have a great day, everyone.